Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's topic of discussion is oscilloscopes and AC Ohm's Law examples. Our objective is to take a look at a handful of illustrated examples meant to simultaneously test your understanding of oscilloscopes, sinusoidal AC properties, phasor equivalents, and AC Ohm's Law. Let me begin this lecture with this unambiguous, non-negotiable statement certain to motivate your active participation in today's lecture. You cannot pass this class until you can reliably, confidently, and repetitively perform these skills with no outside assistance. As an instructor, I often inherit students from other schools or other instructors, and before allowing them into a particular class, I put them through a series of basic interview questions to see if their previous experience qualifies them for inclusion. If they're looking for entry into a Basic Electronics 1 class, I quiz them on basic algebraic manipulation to see if they got the necessary basic math skills. If a student is looking for entry into a Basic Electronics 2 class, I give them an ammeter and make them show me that they can measure current in a DC circuit. If they're looking for entry in one of the PE classes I teach, I make them hold a plank, or if I'm really mean, a boat position for a minute or two. Here is the test I use to see if students pass Basic Electronics 2 and are ready for Basic Electronics 3. Can you use an oscope? Do you have an understanding of sinusoidal AC properties? Can you use phasers and phasor math? And can you use AC Ohm's Law? This is a tall tower and I am dropping you off of it. Are you ready to fly? Prove it. This will be the synthesis of several subjects, so I'll lead you through example one pretty slow. If at any time you necessitate a review of a particular topic or technique you may be struggling with, that option is available and encouraged. Do not let any skill in this lecture escape your attention. You will be tested on this again and again and again and again. Example one. We are presented with an unknown impedance having both resistive and reactive components. We are presented with the following data on an oscilloscope screen. Channel 1 in red is measuring source voltage E. Channel 2 in blue is measuring source current I. Let's first concern ourselves solely with channel 1, source voltage in red for now. Channel 1 is employing a vertical sensitivity of 20 volts per division. Channel 1 is employing a horizontal sensitivity of 2 milliseconds per division. Note it is important to realize that oscopes typically have five subdivisions when a full division, so each subdivision is worth one-fifth, or 0.2 divisions. Your task is to estimate and interpret values to a reasonable degree of accuracy. See if you can determine the peak-to-peak -peak voltage, the peak voltage, the RMS voltage, the period and frequency of the source voltage in red. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Given a vertical scaling of 20 volts per division, it looks like source voltage in red has a peak-to-peak -peak value of roughly 136 volts. A 136-volt peak-to-peak value corresponds to a 68-volt peak value. A 68-volt peak value corresponds to an effective or RMS value of approximately 48.1 volts. It looks like the source voltage waveform is approximately 6.7 divisions wide. At 2 milliseconds per division, this represents a span of 13.4 milliseconds. Finally, a 13.4 millisecond period represents a frequency of approximately 74.6 Hz. Given this data for source voltage, see if you can now place source voltage in phasor format where source voltage is assumed to be the reference, i.e. source voltage will have a phase shift of 0 degrees. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Source voltage expressed as a phasor equivalent will be 48.1 volts at an angle of 0 degrees, where the phasor magnitude is the RMS value of 48.1 volts and a phase shift of 0 degrees implies that it is the reference and all other properties will be measured with respect to this value. How do we know source voltage is the reference? Because I just told you so, and we are assuming source voltage is the reference. That's the beauty of references. Pick one and stick with it. Customarily, one references everything else with respect to source voltage, and if you choose some other reference, you're just being hard-headed. Let's now do the same thing for current data on channel 2 in blue. Channel 2 is employing a vertical sensitivity of 0.1 amps per division. Channel 2 is also employing a horizontal sensitivity of 2 milliseconds per division. Again, it's important to realize that oscopes typically have five subdivisions within a full division, so each subdivision is worth one-fifth, or 0.2 divisions. Your task is to estimate and interpret values to a reasonable degree of accuracy. See if you can determine the current peak-to-peak -peak value, the current peak value, the current RMS value, 
and the phase shift of current with respect to source voltage. Once you've got these properties, see if you can put current in phaser format. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Given a vertical scaling of 0.1 amps per division, or 100 milliampers per division, it looks like current has a peak-to-peak -peak value of roughly 560 milliampers. A 560 milliampere peak-to-peak value corresponds to a 280 milliampere peak value. A 200 milliampere peak value corresponds to an effective or RMS value of approximately 198 milliampers. It looks like current on channel 2 leads source voltage on channel 1 by roughly 0.75 divisions. At 2 milliseconds per division, this represents a lead of 1.5 milliseconds. A jump start of 1.5 milliseconds for a 13.4 millisecond period represents a phase shift of approximately positive 40.3 degrees. Don't make phase shift hard. It's a unit conversion. A differential of 1.5 milliseconds for waveforms that repeat themselves every 13.4 milliseconds represents a time shift of 11.2%. 11.2% of 360 degrees is 40.3 degrees. Finally, current expresses a phasor equivalent will be 198 milliampers at an angle of positive 40.3 degrees, where the phasor magnitude is the RMS value and a phase shift of 40.3 degrees implies it leads source voltage by this amount. Quick question, is the reactive component in this circuit capacitive or is it inductive? By all means, pause the lecture and think about this. If you're tracking, you should have come up with the following conclusion. The reactive component in question is undoubtedly capacitive because current is leading source voltage. This is a dead giveaway. Current leads voltage for capacitive elements. Let's now manipulate phasor data for voltage and current using Ohm's law. So if you can now determine the total impedance for this circuit. Once you've got total impedance in polar format, see if you can resolve it into rectangular format. Once you've got total impedance in rectangular format, determine the component level for the two impedances comprising this circuit. Again, component level values. We're looking for the exact resistor value in units of ohms and exact capacitance value in units of farads that will exhibit these same properties at this excitation frequency, in this case 74.6 Hz. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates that total impedance is 242.9 ohms at an angle of negative 40 degrees. Converting this into rectangular format yields a total impedance of 185.2 minus J times 157.1, where the real component is the resistive component and the imaginary component is the reactive capacitive component. The resistive portion of the unknown impedance is undoubtedly 185.2 ohms. An algebraic manipulation of the capacitive complex impedance formula suggests that a 13.6 microfarad capacitor would yield the desired reactive component at the given excitation frequency of 74.6 Hz. There you have it. If you are still flying, you passed. If you crashed, or maybe scraped a couple treetops along the way, I emphatically suggest you revisit and review those topics and techniques you may have struggled with. In summary, we interpreted sinusoidal properties from oscilloscope data placed these properties in phasor format, and performed a manipulation of AC Ohm's law to determine unknown impedance properties. If you can do this, you are tracking. If you can't do this, you need to learn how to do this ASAP. Let's try another illustrated example, this time with less hand-holding. We are again presented with an unknown impedance having both resistive and reactive components. We're presented with the following data on an oscilloscope screen. Channel 1 in red is again measuring source voltage. Channel 2 in blue is measuring source current. Let's concern ourselves solely with channel 1's source voltage in red for now. Channel 1 is employing a vertical sensitivity of 10 volts per division and a horizontal sensitivity of 1 millisecond per division. See if you can determine the source peak-to-peak -peak voltage value, the peak voltage value, the RMS or effective value, the period, and frequency. Once you've got this data, place source voltage in phasor format, assuming it is the reference. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Even though source voltage spans the same peak-to-peak -peak value of 6.8 divisions as a previous example, note we're using a different vertical sensitivity in this example of 10 volts per division. Given this vertical scaling of 10 volts per division, 
It looks like source voltage has a peak-to-peak -peak value of roughly 68 volts. A 68 volt peak-to-peak -peak value has a 34 volt peak value. A 34 volt peak value corresponds to an effective or RMS value of approximately 24 volts. It looks like the source voltage zero crossings going positive are separated by approximately 7.2 divisions. At 1 millisecond per division, this represents a period of approximately 7.2 milliseconds. A period of 7.2 milliseconds presents a frequency of approximately 138.9 Hz. Source voltage expressed as a phasor equivalent will be 24 volts at an angle of 0 degrees, where the phasor magnitude is the RMS value of 24 volts and a phase shift of 0 degrees implies 8 is the reference and all other properties will be measured with respect to this value. Let's now do the same thing for current data on channel 2 in blue. Channel 2 is employing a vertical sensitivity of 0.1 or 100 milliamperes per division. Channel 2 is also using a horizontal sensitivity of 1 millisecond per division. See if you can determine the current peak-to-peak -peak value, the current peak value, the current RMS value, and the phase shift to current with respect to source voltage. Once you've got these properties, put current in phasor format. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Given a vertical scaling of 0.1 amps per division, or 100 milliamperes per division, it looks like current has a peak-to-peak -peak value of roughly 500 milliamperes. A 500 milliampere peak-to-peak -peak value corresponds to a peak value of 250 milliamperes. A 250 milliampere peak value corresponds to an effective or RMS value of approximately 176.8 milliamperes. It looks like current on channel 2 is lagging source voltage by approximately 0.7 divisions. At 1 milliseconds per division, this represents a lag of approximately 0.7 milliseconds. A delay of 0.7 milliseconds for a 7.2 millisecond period represents a phase shift of approximately negative 35 degrees. Source current expressed as a phasor equivalent would be 176.8 milliampers at an angle of negative 35 degrees, where the phasor magnitude is the RMS value and a phase shift of negative 35 degrees implies it lags source voltage by this amount. Let's now manipulate this phasor data for voltage and current using Ohm's law. See if you can determine the total impedance for this circuit in polar format. Once you've got total impedance in polar format, resolve it into rectangular format. Once you've got total impedance in rectangular format, determine the component level for the two impedances comprising this unknown impedance. Again, component level values. We're looking for the exact components that will exhibit these same properties at this particular excitation frequency. In this case, 138.9 Hertz. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates total impedance is 136 ohms at an angle of 35 degrees. Converting this into rectangular format gives a total impedance of 111.4 plus J78, where the real component is the resistive component and the imaginary component is the reactive inductive component at this excitation frequency of 138.9 Hz. Why is this an inductor and not a capacitor? Because current in this example is lagging voltage. That is a dead giveaway. Current lags voltage for inductive elements. Additionally, total impedance in phasor format has a positive angle, and a rectangular format has a positive imaginary component. This is a clear indicator that the unknown reactive component is inductive in nature. The resistive component is undoubtedly 111.4 ohms. An algebraic manipulation of the inductive complex impedance formula suggests an 89.4 millihenry inductor would yield the desired reactive component at the given excitation frequency. Let's try one more illustrated example. For our final illustrated example, we are again presented with an unknown impedance having both resistive and reactive components. We're presented with the following data on an oscilloscope screen. Yes, this is a different style oscilloscope, yet it's still displaying the same data in a similar format. Do not screw this up just because it's a different color. That is a stupid excuse. Channel 1 in yellow is measuring source voltage. Channel 2 in blue is measuring source current. Let's concern ourselves solely with channel 1's source voltage in yellow for now. Channel 1 is employing a vertical sensitivity of 2 volts per division. Channel 1 is employing a horizontal sensitivity of 2.5 milliseconds per division. See if you can determine source voltage peak to peak value, source voltage peak value, source voltage effective or RMS value, the period, and the frequency of the source voltage. Once you've got this data, Place source voltage in phasor format 
assuming source voltage is the reference. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. You'll note source voltage in this example isn't perfectly symmetric because the positive peaks are ever so slightly smaller than the negative peaks. This being said, it's not that bad of a difference. Given a vertical scaling of 2 volts per division, it looks like source voltage is a peak-to-peak -peak value of roughly 11.8 volts. An 11.8 volt peak-to-peak -peak value corresponds to a peak value of approximately 5.9 volts. A 5.9 volt peak value corresponds to an effective or RMS value of approximately 4.2 volts. It looks like the source voltage zero crossings going positive are separated by 5 divisions. At 2.5 milliseconds per division, this represents a period of approximately 12.5 milliseconds. A 12.5 millisecond period corresponds to a frequency of 80 Hz. Source voltage expressed as a phasor equivalent will be 4.2 volts at an angle of 0 degrees, where the phasor magnitude is the RMS value of 4.2 volts, and a phase shift of 0 degrees implies source voltage is the reference and all other properties will be measured with respect to this value. Let's now do the same thing for current data on channel 2 in blue. Channel 2 is employing a vertical sensitivity of 10 mA per division. Channel 2 is also employing a horizontal sensitivity of 2.5 ms per division. See if you can determine the current peak to peak value, the current peak value, the current effective or RMS value, and the phase shift of current with respect to source voltage. Once you've got these properties, put current in phasor format. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Given a vertical scaling of 10 mA per division, it looks like current has a peak to peak value of roughly 52 mA. A 52 mA peak to peak value corresponds to a peak value of approximately 26 mA. A 26 mA peak value corresponds to an effective or RMS value of approximately 18.4 mA. It looks like current on channel 2 leads voltage on channel 1 by roughly 0.8 divisions. At 2.5 milliseconds per division, this represents a lead of approximately 2 milliseconds. A jump start of 2 millisecond for a waveform that repeats itself every 12.5 milliseconds represents an angular phase shift of approximately 57.6 degrees. Current expressed as a phasor equivalent would be 18.4 mA at an angle of positive 57.6 degrees, where the phasor magnitude is the RMS value and a phase shift of positive 57.6 degrees implies source current leads source voltage by this amount. The measure utility on this particular oscope allows us to display automated RMS frequency and phase shift measurements for the desired properties. Automated measurements confirm our manual measurements to a reasonable degree of accuracy. Let's now manipulate phasor data for voltage and current using Ohm's law. See if you can determine the total impedance for this circuit. Once you've got total impedance in polar format, resolve into rectangular format. Once you've got total impedance in rectangular format, determine the component level for the two impedances comprising the circuit. Again, component level values. We're looking for the exact components that will exhibit these same properties at this particular excitation frequency. In this case, 80 Hz. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following data. An application of Ohm's law demonstrates total impedance is 226.9 ohms at an angle of negative 57.6 degrees. Converted this into rectangular format, yields a total impedance of 121.6 minus J191.6, where the real component is the resistive component and the imaginary component is the reactive capacitive component at an excitation frequency of 80 Hz. Why is it capacitive and not inductive? Because current for this example is leading source voltage. That is a dead giveaway. Current leads voltage for a capacitive network. Additionally, total impedance in phasor format has a negative angle and a rectangular format has a negative imaginary component. These are yet more clear indicators that the unknown reactive element is capacitive in nature. The resistor is undoubtedly 121.6 ohms. An algebraic manipulation of the capacitive complex impedance formula suggests a 10.4 microfarad capacitor would yield the desired reactive component at the given excitation frequency. All right, that's enough for today. Again, I must remind you that these techniques represent a mandatory minimum level competency that you will be expected to reliably demonstrate on a regular basis. You simply must be able to interpret sinusoidal properties from an oscilloscope display, place sinusoidal properties in phasor format, and use AC Ohm's Law. If you need to revisit or review any of these topics, that option is available and encouraged. 
In conclusion, this lecture looked at a handful of illustrated examples that reviewed oscope data interpretation, sinusoidal properties, phasers and phasor math, complex impedance calculations, and AC Ohm's law. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.